I don't know if you intended this, but you just dropped a major gem I want to bring to our audience because I really love to uh, motivate and inspire whenever our guests drop a major gem. You said you learned that you can be happy wherever you're at. And I know you were talking geographical location, but just in life, I don't care, you know, where you're at in life, you can literally be happy where you're at. So I want people to pull from that statement because people often think I'm going to be happy when I make X amount of dollars, or I'm going to be happy when I get to whatever the variable might be. But just as a gym, you can be happy literally where you're at. I don't care if you're living in the projects or you're living in a mansion. I don't care if you're living in a studio or the penthouse. You can be happy where you're at. So thanks for even saying that. Now nah, that that's the truth. And and I think one of the the one thing that holds people down from being happy or from enjoying life is this notion that I have to get this or I have to get that to be happy. And you can tell yourself the re- lie to yourself really the reason you're not happy is because you don't have this amount of money or this amount of power or these material goods, but it really is more inside of you. And you and I, I mean, the business you're in, the business I am, I'm in, you meet a lot of people who are wealthy, rich, famous, and aren't happy. In fact, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA a few years ago said he's struck by how many of the NBA players aren't happy. And Kyrie Irving said, you know what? He's right. And these are guys that have everything the world could offer. And so that's, yeah, that's very important. Now, yeah, look, if we really look at history, you'll even see that some of our ancestors who were enslaved, even though obviously it's a negative situation, they wanted out. They found a way through their faith to make it, you know, maintain, sing songs of protest sing songs of struggle, but also sing some songs of victory mm-hmm. and hope. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't, some people mistake, mistake that for, oh, they were happy in slavery. They didn't fight to get out of slavery. No, you can fight, you can push, you can know that you have a ways to go or there are things you want to gain and yet still be happy during the fight, during the struggle, right? I, I, I think... You know, we as African-Americans, I, I, I'm i one that has come to believe that we deserve reparations and that we should be pushing for reparations. But that doesn't mean that until we get them or if we don't get them, I'm going to be miserable. And I think we as a people are going to be stuck in a lower level. No, even as we push for that, we still can be happy in the position we're in and make the most out of the position we're in, even as we may push for something different. Uh, You just said a mouthful. And that is, uh, you know, you took it back to slavery where, as you should. But that's the wonderful thing about our people. It's the wonderful thing about our women in, in particular. You know, I think about my mother, even as you were talking and it did, you know, I grew up poor in the South Bronx uh, and some of the happiest times of my life comes from being in the South Bronx when we had nothing. But my mother always sang songs of joy. We were always brought to the church um, since we were young. And that's what it was all about. It didn't matter, you know, what you had or what you didn't have. You were still uh, the the the... the your perspective on life, you know, shouldn't depend on material things. And and that's one thing I will credit with our people is we have a way of of singing songs of victory and claiming victory when materialistically we don't have anything, you know, um, um, in our presence at that moment. So it's, it's, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we, we've obviously proven to be a very resilient people. And I've made this statement before. I think that the strongest person in America 
-hmm. is the black woman. Without a doubt. And I say that because number one, they have to deal with the racism and discrimination and hardships of the mainstream society, like all black people. And yet they also have to deal with a lot of the mess that we as black men put them through, you know? And yet when you look at things like the suicide statistics, black women are at the lowest, you know? Uh, when you look at things like college education, master's degrees or advanced degrees, black women are among the highest. And they're lapping black men. I mean, two thirds now of like the PhDs, two thirds of black PhDs, two thirds of black master's degrees and things like that are black women. And I think you said it about your mom. What we, one of the reasons that they are so strong is because we all know black women have had this immovable faith in God. Whoa. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not saying they don't make mistakes and all that stuff, but they have that faith in God. And you know this. I mean, how many brothers, (laughs) certainly this generation is getting a little different, but previous generations, you can almost bet every brother had a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, somebody dragging them to church. You know, when they were little, as you said, and we as black men need to tap into that faith that our black women have had. Because as I said, by every measure, they're more successful than us by far and more well-adjusted than us by far. And it's, I believe it's because of their faith. And the, the truth is, man, we as men, regardless of your race, but we as men, we are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of our households. Mm -hmm. So it's backwards that when we look back on our faith, we can only count on that mom, that grandma, that aunt. We used to hear her praying all the time. She used to be the one always talking about Jesus and reading her Bible and all that. It should be the men, women too, but we should be able to say, I saw my, I used to catch my dad praying. I, my dad was the one making sure we went to church. My dad was the one I used to see reading the Bible. You know, that's when we get to that point, that'll help us a great deal as a people. And my whole thing is we want to, we, we got to improve the quality of life in our communities. And I think that will go a long way in doing it. So let me ask you this, um, you know, and I, I do want to get to what people know you for, which is your, your professional career, but I want to stay on this line for a second, because I I find it so fascinating and it's always such a pleasure to speak to a brother, um, an accomplished brother who is loud and proud about his faith and is not just talking it, but living it as you do. Uh, So we talked about the church and we talked about women. Uh, Why is it that that you think Because me going to church and being in a black church my entire life, it's always lopsided in terms of the numbers uh, when it comes to the men versus the women in church. Traditionally, it's probably four to five, four or five to one. Right. You know, that you'll see more women in the church than men. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons. (laughs) Um, one, I think in, a, in America or in the West, as we call it, Christianity as a whole, regardless of race, has been somewhat feminized. But you can multiply that by many times over in the black church in particular. All right. That, and as you said, it, there are estimates that 80 percent of the quote unquote black church is female. And I think there are many reasons for that. One, let me say this. We are not presenting the gospel in the right way. And I'm generalizing, obviously some individuals are doing a great job of it. When you say we, who are you talking about? I'm sorry to come in, cut in, but I I wanna be specific. When you say we, which we? We as the the black church. Okay. Black Christians, black churches as a whole. And I know every, there, there are many black churches that are doing a great job of it. 
but as a whole. Because when you look in the Bible, you don't see a dearth of men. You don't see a lack of men. Now, you see women of God, of course, but you see strong men of God. It's never like God can't find any men or where all the good men of God, where, you know, it's women doing everything. So that tells me right there, we're not presenting the faith in, the, in an appropriate way, or otherwise we wouldn't have this big lack of men and this lopsided imbalance that we do have. So I think if you look at our churches, a lot of times there's a, a, a hyper, there's a, fo- a hyper focus on emotion, emotionalism. Mm-hmm. And that's, we're all emotional beings. So that's good to some degree but I think it's going overboard and that can appeal more to women. Whereas you look at some of the, it's not that black men don't want spirituality because you look at groups like the nation of Islam, the black Hebrew Israelites, they have men, they have more men than women. And, but they don't focus on, it's not just a lot of emotion and getting you to dance and getting you to shout. And that may come naturally, but it's not focused on getting that reaction. And so I think that's part of it. And uh, so I think we have to present the gospel if we're men in a masculine way, you know? And that that's one thing we do with the King Movement, which the organization I preside over, mm-hmm. uh, it's about living the gospel as men of God and presenting it in a masculine way. I think a second reason in particular talking about Christianity is that if we be honest with ourselves, white Americans control most aspects of our life outside of the personal interpersonal relationships, which even then can be affected by the systems that whites have put in place. But the economic system we live under controlled by whites, the educational system we live under controlled by whites, the judicial or policing system we live under controlled by whites. The one thing that no other human being should be able to control is your relationship to your creator, to God and your spirituality. And so I believe a lot of black men feel like, you know, there's that myth, that lie, that Christianity is the white man's religion. So a lot of brothers feel like if I come to Christianity, I have to kind of come under the white man again. I'm already under him in terms of economics, education, uh, the policing system. I'm not giving my spirituality to him. And that actually is a biblical mentality because the Bible says there's one God and and man, and there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. So the white man has nothing to do with it. If you if you follow Christ, it is between you and God. It, you don't have to come under white folks or black folks or Asian folks or whoever. It's between you and God and his word. And so I think that that, but brothers having that misconception that I have to be more submissive again to the white man if I become a Christian, I think that's a part of what keeps them from church as well. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.